Salutations and welcome to Serafina Sephira Says. Today we will continue with the ignominious blunders of Primrose Goodwing in Chapter 3, The Glass Gyad. The star sapphire wand rested on the top shelf of the mantle. Dust dimmed the astral pattern in the wand's blue core gem to a faint silver shadow. Great Aunt Rosamond told me once that it belonged to the renowned fairy godmother, Rosebud Goodwing. But my thrice great aunt had been lost in the mortal veil for over three centuries now, so it wasn't like she was going to miss it, right? I sighed. I hadn't even eaten breakfast yet, and already I was contemplating stealing, er, borrowing, a priceless family heirloom. But it wasn't like I had a choice. My need to thieve was truly dire. I ran the pocketbook's warning through my head one more time. A fairy godmother must have a wand to safely channel magic in the mortal veil. The magic currents of that world are unruly and unpredictable and could result in a spontaneous combustion of the unwary fairy, as in the tragic case of Buttercup Goldwing. Spontaneous combustion or not, I still couldn't ignore the prickling guilt I felt as I reached for the wand. I nearly knocked it off the shelf as Mother's voice startled me. Primrose, she called. It's time to go. Her statement was followed by a loud sniff. Your c coach is waiting. Coming, I said. It was now or never. Snatching the wand, I slid the slim crystal baton up my left sleeve. As I left the parlor, I twisted magic out of the air into an ephemera replica of the wand and placed it on the mantel shelf. Mother buried me in parcels the instant she caught sight of me. There are apricot scones in the hamper for your breakfast and three pairs of Everclean gossamer shifts in your chest. Oh dear, I think I forgot to pack you a flagon of honey water. Mother, stop worrying, I said. I'll be fine and possibly finned by the end of the day if my plans went wrong. I changed my mind about the fine part when I saw the coach waiting for me outside. A gold gilt rowan leaf bucked in the air as a skinny pixie boy at the front tried to rein in four swallowtail butterflies. The butterflies swooped and strained against their slender bridles to reach a clump of purple violets blooming between the tree roots. Titania's toes, lay off the nectar or you'll be too tipsy to fly straight, the boy chided. Stingy spoil sport, one of the butterflies hiccuped. I just wanted a sip. Mind your manners, Morgana, the boy said. We've a passenger present. He tipped his cap in my direction. Milkweed's the name, flying is my game. Welcome to the Swallowtail Express. Anywhere you can fly, we can fly faster. That's our motto. Squashberries. My family was so desperate to whisk me off to Uncle Thimbley, they hired the express coach. Ouch, that hurt. Don't forget to check your silver basin and uh, write me by moonlight every evening, Mother said, dabbing her eyes with a kerchief. I won't. The lie fell numbly from my lips as I landed in the middle of the swaying rowan leaf. The coach tilted as I dumped my parcels onto the floor. Milkweed yanked a band of magic out of the air and bolted my belongings in place just before they rolled off the edge. I'd hold on to something if I was you, Milkweed said. I hate losing passengers. Tis awful bad for business. Uh, that doesn't happen often, does... The rest of my words were blown away as the butterflies jolted forward. My stomach lurched up as I tumbled to the back of the rowan leaf. The terraces of Caroli blurred past me in a dizzy haze of colors as the Swallowtail Express descended at break wing speed. I waited until the butterflies were racing over Market Terrace before I made my move. Twisting magic out of the nearest current shimmering in the air, I wove an identical image of myself clinging to the other side of the coach. Sit still and keep your lips shut, got it? I asked. Er, myself? My twin nodded demurely, her lips compressed in a tight line. Drop the smile. It's a bit too creepy, I said. The unnatural grin vanished, and my twin stared blankly ahead. The ephemeral me had translucent edges that wouldn't fool anyone on close inspection, but with luck, I'd be in the mortal veil by the time my twin evaporated at midnight. Time to pull off my own vanishing act. Is that a sprig of candy tuft blooming in the gutter, I shouted. The butterflies swerved to the left as they caught sight of my quick twist of magic and pink petal. 
Whoa, steady, you greedy gluttons, Milkweed yelled. As he wrestled with the reins, I leapt from the coach and dove towards the shade of a deserted vendor stall. But I should have known that I wouldn't escape that easily. Someone crashed into me from behind and knocked us both to the cobblestones. I'm so glad you ditched your ride, Star Tulip panted. I flew by your place just as you left, but I never thought I'd catch up before. A sharp expression replaced the usual vague serenity of her face. Why did you jump anyway? Your mother said you were going to visit some elvish relation in Green Knoll. Actually, I was just trying to sneak off until you completely ruined my quiet escape. Awkward. Prim. Startulip's eyes widened as she noticed the star sapphire tip of Rosebud's wand hanging out the edge of my sleeve. What have you done? She whispered. Nothing. Yet, I said, quickly pushing the core gem back up my sleeve. Let me rephrase that. I can explain. I dragged her into the deserted vendor stall behind rows of evaporated dream cordials and spilled everything from my failure on the FGT to my genius plan to prove my right to, um, legally hold a wand. By the time bursts, by the time I'd finished, star tulips' wings were sparkling with bright bursts of agitation that bounced off the tall glass vials. You can't sacrifice your future to this absurd fascination with helping humans, Star Tulip said flatly. No dirt grabbing human is worth the risk you're taking. It is to me, I shot back. Somewhere in the mortal veil, there's a dirt grabbing beggar or orphan in desperate need right now. I just know I could be the fairy godmother to turn their fortunes. All I need is one chance to prove myself to the fairy court. I gulped. Are you going to tell on me? No. Startulip rolled her eyes. If I had a thimble's worth of sense in my body, I might. But lucky for you, I never have and probably never will. Least of ways, that's what Mistress Redora is always saying. Crumpled chrysanthemum leaves and cornflower petals drifted to her feet as she emptied her pockets. Now, if I'd known you were going to flit off like this, I would have charmed up a whole batch of useful petals, like showy lady slipper for courage. But these will have to do, she said, looping a black satin pouch through my dress sash and knotting the drawstrings tight. The pouch should keep the spell strong for a full moon cycle. Throw the petals in front of you when you find yourself in serious peril. You know, the dragon about to crisp your wings off kind of peril, not the lost in the woods with no breadcrumb sort. Who's the most fabulous fairy in all of Carol, I asked. Me, I know, she grumbled, but don't push it. So... How are you planning to slip into the mortal veil carrying a stolen wand? Star Tulip held a hand up. No, wait, don't tell me. Her lips twisted into a sly grin. That way, no one can spell the truth out of me. She glided from the stall, hovering uncertainly in the air. I promise to visit you every afternoon if you get turned into a guppy. What kind of food do you think you'd prefer? As a fish, because I could bring... Goodbye, Tulip, I interrupted, before she could make me feel any smaller. So, not even my best friend had confidence in my ability to pull my scheme off. That was depressing. Good luck, Star Tulip said. I'll never forget the look on Kaya Lily's face when you dumped all that water on top of her lovely locks. She flew off without a backward glance, but her question about Rosebud's wand coiled in the back of my mind like a restless serpent. The fairy court strictly monitored the passage of all magical goods and devices into the mortal veil. If any of the border guards watching the gates between worlds caught me with a stolen wand, it would be the life of a guffy for me. Nibbling on lily pads and pond scum for a hundred years just didn't strike me as all that appealing. The golden portcullis? Far too risky. To get guppified before I even made it out of the front gate would be beyond humiliating. I slouched against a vial with iridescent dream bubbles still floating at the bottom and nervously twined a curl around my finger. Ditching my coach had been all too easy, but catching one to the mortal veil would cost me more than candy tuft and tricks. There was another way I could sneak into the mortal veil, but respectable fairy folk never spoke of that way. It was obvious I needed someone utterly disreputable to help me out, the unsavory kind of creature I'd only find at the Lost Bazaar. My courage shriveled with each wing bait I made towards my destination, but I forced myself to keep flying. To turn back now would be even more pathetic than failing the FGT in the first place. I perched on the lip of the dried up wishing well I'd sat on yesterday, waited, 
It wasn't long before a familiar putrid aroma assailed my nostrils. Snitch Quick shoved a gray sliver of wood in my face. Can I interest you in Queen Calypso's toothpick? Her serene majesty used it during the famous Midsummer's Eve banquet of... Not interested, I interrupted. I rushed my next words out before I could change my mind. Can you take me to the glass dryad? The gnome flinched at the name and dropped the questionable toothpick. A pretty pixie like you should stay away from the likes of her. The glass dryad's not nice, no, not nice at all. He pulled a wizened red thing from the grimy reed bag slung on his shoulders. How would you like to buy a dried salamander tongue installed? Seasoned with fire pepper and nutritiously delicious. Snitch cook will give you a fair deal. Can you take me or not? The gnome's knuckles crackled as he twisted his gnarled fingers together. Snitch grip can take you, yes, but the glass dryad is a shade lady, a dark sage. Who helps both villains and heroes for the right price, I finished. Tell me something I don't know. Pulling out a snow white bean from my pocket, I waved it in the gnome's wrinkly face. His beady eyes followed the bean with avarice. He knew quality when he saw it. No one in the Goodwing family was better than me when it came to growing enchanted legumes. I soaked this bean in half a cup of ensorcelled spring water for 12 moons. Take me to the glass dryad and it's yours, I promised. Snitch Creek's cheeks puffed up with air, popped. Boo, he said. In the space of an eye blink, he grabbed the bean, spun on his heel and scurried away. Wait, I demanded, I thought we had a bargain. So we does, pretty pixie, and more's the pity, Snitch Quick muttered. He waggled his long pointed ears. Listen, the glass dryad is singing today, setting her traps in the air. All one has to do is follow the notes. That's it, I said, incredulous. Follow the music? Ow! The gnome's grin was wickedly pleased. But if Snitch Quick had told you that first, he wouldn't turn a magic bean now, would he? My wings sparkled rose pink with indignation. Why, you devious little... Snitch Quick vanished into an alley packed with wicker cages full of pulsing will-o'-the-wisps before I could name him a sneaky fink. I shot after him, but even flying overhead, I found it nearly impossible to keep up with a slippery gnome. He zigzagged between crowds of fairy folk and leaped over vendor stalls as nimbly as a frog. It was only after I cut through the mists rising from two steaming vats of spider wart broth that I realized just exactly where Snitch Quick was leading me, the purple quarter of the Lost Bazaar. And now, a word from this week's sponsor. Goodwing's Magic Beans. A guaranteed vertical adventure in every enchanted legume. Easy to grow. Just apply one tablespoon dirt, and a liberal sprinkling of water, like so. Side effects include a moderate risk of being eaten by a giant. Warning, do not consume the bean. Consumption may lead to a spontaneous explosion. Don't put it in your mouth. <clears throat> oh right, where were we? Oh yes, the purple quarter of the Lost Bazaar. Lengths of indigo gauze hung suspended from strings barely 10 feet away. Triple hexed me, panic stalled my wings, and I tumbled through the air and crashed into a barrel of dried feverfew. Digging myself out, I shuddered as sheer wisps of violet fluttered lazily on the breeze. One spark, just one wayward spark of magic could ignite the veils into a firestorm worthy of a dragon. Straining the multi-hues of magic into individual wavelengths made them more powerful, but also more unstable. Indigo was the most volatile color in the sun spectrum. Only fools played with purple. Snitch Quick pushed aside the deadly indigo veils like they were nothing more than common gossamer and came to a halt in front of me. What's with the lolly dodging? Has fear clipped your wings already? He asked. His feet shifted uneasily. I can leave you home, but you ain't getting your bean back. I brushed stray bits of fever few from my tangled locks and gave the gnome my frostiest glare. Of course I'm still coming. I broke off as a melody as slow and deep as sap trickled into my ears. A tiny gasp escaped my lips before I could catch it. I think I hear the glass dryad. 
Humph, Snitch Quick grumbled. Laura would have to be deaf not to hear her constant buzzing. That or dead. He gave his ears a fierce scratching that loosed a cloud of dirt. Her stinging siren music does my noggin such a terrible itch. The glass dryad's voice fell against my ears like the whispering rush of the fairy groves. Breeze bent. I hardly cared as I drifted past Snitchquick and flew deeper into the indigo haze of the purple quarter. My sole desire was to find the source of the melody before I drowned in it. The song slowly took on the shape of syllables that purled into words I could understand. Who will buy my baubles fair, made of glass and stillborn air? What will you trade to cheat death? I can sell you life's lost breath. Why tremble at trinkets I bid you pay? Worse pain lies in throwing heart away. Don't let your true wish fade and fall. Pay my price to heed dreams call. But where be you bold, lovely, or clever? Happy endings, I promise never. And then I saw her. A woman stark white as a birch and over nine feet tall, striding in the middle of the street. Cobblestones cracked under her gnarled root feet with each step. Hollow witch balls of all colors and sizes glinted with an odd oily light in her tangled crown of rowan twigs and golden aspen leaves. The glass dryad drifted to a standstill as she noticed me hovering beside her like a honey-struck bee. Have we met before, little shiny one, she asked. Her voice fell in an emerald murmur that crowded out every thought in my head. You seem familiar to me. Uh-huh, I managed to say, barely. Perchance, in one of my visions then, the glass dryad lilted. My dreams play such tricks on me that sometimes... I can't untwine illusion from reality. But if you are indeed true flesh, tell me then, what is your wish? Is it to buy true love's essence distilled from a broken heart? Or perhaps the elixir of eternal youth? Willow with the hands pulled a blue bobble from her spiraling hair and dangled it in front of me. Her hypnotic syllables shattered abruptly as my eyes caught the reflection of a fairy skull rolling within the glass. I noticed then that each bobble hanging in her tangled hair held something within their glass confines. The witch balls chimed with the tinkle of jewels and the dry rattle of bones. Would I be the next piece trapped in her collection? I w w wish to buy passage to the mortal veil, I said, wincing at the way my words stumbled from my lips next to her lyrical flow. The glass dryad's chiming bobbles fell silent. Her liquid amber eyes dripped slow tears down each cheek in matching trails of gold as she regarded me. Ah, now I remember your face, she said. I've been waiting for you a great while. Evening, Primrose, Goodwing's daughter. My wings shivered against my back as she smiled then, and not just because she knew my full name. Her slit-like mouth was lined with jagged black splinters, easily three inches long. Won't you come into my garden, she asked. Her frond fingers gestured towards a narrow side alley. The path was overgrown with ragweed and stinging nettles that burst between the slender bars of a silver filigree gate. I squashed my fear to a fluttering ball in my middle. So certainly I squeaked. <sighs> a moment later, her gate clanged shut behind me and I found myself surrounded by a riotous collection of flowering weeds, yellow hawk bit and lilac spikes of cuckoo flower purple loose strife, and finely haired mouse ear. Thick moss carpeted the cobblestones. Bittervine climbed over the two walls and laced together to form a false green twilight, so that I half believed myself to be deep in a forest glade instead of a side alley of Caroli. So, you say the mortal veil is your heart's desire, the glass dryad said, as she rooted her feet in a circle of rich black loam. Prove it. 
There was only one thing I had to trade of any real worth. I hesitated for the barest sliver of a second before reaching up to my neck. One tug, and I pulled the silver unicorn strand out from under my collar. A round glass locket dangled at the tip that pulsed with a faint ember. My birth star, I said, blowing on the glass so that the ember flared with a soft halo of light. It fell the night I was born, but never burned out, the glass dryad finished. I flinched as a willow frond whipped out and curled around the locket like a slim green serpent. And here I thought my dreams whispered lies to me when they told me that one day I would meet a pixie with a living birth star. She dropped the locket back against my neck. A rare trinket, I'll give you that. But I have trinkets aplenty. No, I want something much more common and practical. Something you'll miss every hour for the rest of your life. I want your wings. My wings? I fluttered backwards, my wings sparkling with quick bursts of fright. I couldn't possibly. I mean, fairy wings are pure crystalline magic. They'll never grow back. Anger twisted through my words. But you know that already, don't you? What you ask of me is cruel. Ah, but you forget, she interrupted. Her voice grew harsh as snapping splinters as she gnashed her teeth together. I am the glass dryad. My visions span both fairy and the mortal veil. Not even your precious queen dares to challenge my dealings. So pay my price or be gone before I tire of you. Warring voices raced, raced through my head. Just fly home before she picks off your wings and stuffs you in a bauble. Forget the mortal veil. No dirt grubbing human is worth the risk. I could hear star tulip pleading followed by the brass acorn snide taunts. Failure, flake wing flop! Sweet Vetch's mocking voice was last. Are you the right fairy godmother for the job? I'd never know, unless... Dual bands of lightning arced over my skin as I scythed my wings at the base with a sharp twist of magic. A hollow space blossomed inside me as my wings gave off weak prism flickers and fluttered to the ground. Make the trade, I said tears streaming down my face. Don't be ridiculous, the glass dryad said. She closed a clear glass ball over my wings and added it to the baubles chiming in her tangled crown. You'll need a proper human disguise first. One that won't vanish come the strike of twelve. Huh? I yelped as the glass dryad shattered a witch ball over my head. Scarlet slivers of glass dug into my skin, and within the space of a breath, I shot from five inches tall to five feet tall. How do you like it? The glass dryad asked, angling a mirror shard in front of my face. The disguise will last for a year and a day before the slivers dissolve. Whatever else others may say, I am not ungenerous. A fiery-haired girl, who looked barely sixteen mortal summers, stared back at me with silver eyes. It'll do, she, I said. Even in human form, I could feel the loss of my wings like a dull ache. Would the pain ever completely fade? I started as the glass dryad shattered another bobble at my feet. Seeds of all shapes and sizes littered the ground between us. Now, where do you wish to go? The glass dryad asked brusquely. The mortal veil is vast and has many kingdoms. Swallow one of these seeds and you will find yourself at your chosen destination. Sesame is popular by all accounts. I'd prefer a smaller kingdom, one that's rather out of the way, I said. The less important the kingdom, the less likely I was to run into other fairy godmothers and get turned into a guppy, I hoped. The glass dryad held up a brown seed no bigger than a grain of rice. Caraway will do nicely, I think. She dropped the seed into my open palms. Farewell, Goodwing's daughter. Perchance we will meet again in visions. Perchance not, I said. I popped the caraway seed into my mouth and swallowed. The seed slid down my throat and my eyes hazed over as the glass dryad and her garden dissolved into a pearl gray twilight. Dark cords of mist rushed over me. I hiccuped once, just before my world blacked out. 
but with my second breath, I opened my eyes to find myself lying in the middle of a charming forest grove. The mortal veil! It was finally, truly mine. Sunlight streamed through the leaves, a sparrow trilled overhead, and a breeze carried me the scent of daisies, columbine, and rotting bog. Skunk cabbage! The glass giant had dumped me into a swamp. Mud gurgled over my elbows and sucked at my legs. I willed a blast of magic up my wand to push myself free. Too bad there wasn't nearly enough being drawn into the core gem to complete the spell. Oops, how could I have forgotten the pocketbook's 13th admonition? Exercise extreme caution when channeling the thinner magical currents of the mortal veil. A fairy godmother whose spell funnels too much magic at once risks cannibalization by her wand, as in the tragic case of Primrose Goodwing, pathetic pixie and absolute dolt. The straining wand yanked magic from the nearest available source, me. I struggled against the relentless draining, but I was already weak from the loss of my wings. The spell backfired. The force of the explosion threw me clear of the bog and into an obliging tree. Ow, I think I fainted after that. Thank you for listening, my dear provincials. Until next week, tira lira.